Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Thanks for taking the time on a, on a nice, sunny spring morning. Welcome to spring. It, uh, I'm Representative Mike Merwicki, and with Michelle, we are the two reps in the Wyndham Ford District of Putney, Dummerston, and Westminster. Um, kind of feels like winter has lasted a year, and sometimes it feels like five years since last March when COVID first shut down. But here we are, and... Uh, I think I'm starting to feel the weariness lift from trying to get through the, the winter and getting through COVID. And I'm feeling more optimistic. Uh, I got my first shot and I'm gonna get my second one before too long. And I feel like by summer, things might be very much different. I also got my seedlings for this year's garden coming up nicely and uh, it's, it's a hopeful sign because I've still got big piles of snow in our, in our back of the house. Uh, we're gonna, Michelle and I are both gonna do a little update and then we have uh, someone who's gonna do a presentation and we're gonna be opening up for discussion and dialogue for whatever you wanna talk about if you have questions or suggestions for us. Uh, we're at the time in the legislature where we just passed what we hope is the midpoint. Um, things have been extra busy as we try and get things out of committee and then start passing bills on the floor of the house so we can get them over to the Senate. And um, then they'll have plenty of time to work on them and then head towards adjournment. Uh, it's been especially busy for the appropriations committee because they're working hard on next year's budget. And then as soon as they get done with that, we are going to be start working on the next round of stimulus money that's coming from the federal government. And I, I'm, I'm noting that we don't have a lot of details yet on this, but what I'm hearing is this, the money is being focused a little differently than the past. There's more money going to individuals. Now in the past, uh, there's been a, some money going out to individuals, but lots of money going to businesses. And there's been questions about how much some of those businesses really need it. Is it that important for banks to get as much money as they've gotten? Is it that important for airlines to get as much money as they've gotten? And there are businesses like that that some people think are essential, but um, I'm all for the priorities that have been set by this president, that we're gonna get more money to individuals. We're gonna get more money to kids with families. There's a stipulation in this, in this uh, stimulus bill that hopes to ch change the whole landscape for, for children living in poverty. And I'm all for that. Um, in Vermont, we wanna make sure that the stimulus funds go to those people who really need it, needs to be sent out equitably and with accountability. So um, I work in the government operations committee and we have been working on some larger issues such as elections, and how we're gonna do them in the future. There's some things we learned from COVID that seem to work really well. The whole mail a ballot out to everyone in the general election worked really well. Uh, whether we need to have stamps on every envelope is, is another question because a lot of people, uh, at least in the towns we represent, I think drop theirs off at the drop boxes that we put in. So we're gonna be taking testimony from people. We wanna hear from you. We wanna hear what worked for you for what didn't. Um, one of the things that I have been working on personally uh, is a bill that we started last year and then COVID hit and it got put on the back burner. And that's to create a statewide youth council. This would bring students uh, between the ages of 11 and 18 from all over the state together once a month, it would be 28 students in this council for them to share what's going on in our lives. And then the next step is for them to have contact with legislators and with the governor. 
if we're serious about keeping youth in Vermont, if we're serious about attracting young people to Vermont, we need to listen to them. We need to listen to what's important to them and, and then act on that. So that's one of the things that I've been pushing for. Uh, before I hand it over to Michelle, I just wanna share that um, we've been doing a lot better with vaccination shots. And if you look behind me, the governor just announced that there are dates for everybody to get sign up for vaccinations now. And I'm gonna get my head out of the way a little bit and just make sure people can see age 50, March 29th, age 40 plus, that's April 5th, <laughs> age 30, um, it's April 12th, and then age 16 plus, the April 19th. And I, I think this is really exciting that uh, <clears throat> we're getting this out there. We're not helpless against this virus anymore. And um, there's some good things happening and I'm, I'm hopeful by summer, we're really gonna get, get in front of these things. Doesn't mean we don't have other pieces that we need to look at. And I've been saying that we're really dealing with, with three pandemics, COVID, climate, and racial and social justice. And when COVID goes away, we still have to get back to focusing on climate and racial social justice. And we are. So <clears throat> with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my district mate and I wanna let people know she's doing some great work. Uh, as a freshman, she's jumped right in with both feet. Uh, she's, she's working hard and it's been a pleasure to work with her. And here she is. The Michelle Bosman. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I look forward to the day that we can do this in the Putney General Store and drink a cup of coffee and look each other in the eye. But um, that's probably not going to happen until uh, later in the year. But maybe by the maybe by the summer, we can do something like that. Um, it has been a huge learning curve for me. I'm um, going on my third month here as a legislator. And I'm um, enormously busy. Some days I feel like my head is going to explode with all the information that's coming in that I'm, I'm learning as a citizen legislator. Um, but, uh, but we're getting there. So I must say that the, the majority of my time is spent in my committee, which is corrections and institutions. And I, uh, it was one of the committees that I requested to be placed on. There were four of them I had as possibilities. And this was the one that I landed with. Um, after working at the, uh, as a reentry coordinator at the Community Justice Center in Brattleboro. So I came into that position with a, a strong interest in reforming the correction system. And, and we have done some work in that area. The biggest, uh, the biggest part of our time has been spent looking at a report that came out last December from uh, Downs, Racklin and Martin is a, a, a private organization that did a study related to the sexual misconduct allegations at the women's correctional facility up in Chittenden. And they had an, a series of recommendations about things that should happen to increase staff accountability. And uh, we are, are recommending all of the uh, policies that they advocated for, we have put into a committee bill and that will actually be presented on the floor on Tuesday. So that has taken up a large amount of my attention. Uh, but the other part of what my committee has been working on is what's called the capital bill. And honestly, before I joined this committee, I didn't really know what that meant. But the capital bill is this year $127 million that come in uh, initially recommended by the governor in terms of where he wants to designate funding. And then we have to either affirm or change and recommend what we would like the House and the Senate to agree to in terms of designating funding in many, many, many areas of the budget. And it's called corrections and institutions, but it goes far beyond institutions. Um, our, my committee in the last week has designated money to clean up contaminants in contaminated water sites in schools and daycare centers. We put in funding to expand the long trail to support historic preservation, affordable housing, um, some funds for restoring the Capitol building, putting a new roof on the courthouse in Brattleboro and a whole variety of other things. Um, one of the areas that we have spent an awful lot of time on, and I'll let Malika talk to you a little bit more about that, is funding to go towards what, what's being called a secure residential facility for uh, people in mental health crisis. And um, I'll let Malika introduce uh, that topic. 
uh, in a little bit more depth. But that is an area that my committee spent a lot of time working on. And the original vision that came through for that, um, for that proposal, for that secure facility has been changed thanks to the advocacy of a number of people throughout our state. And I'm grateful for that. I'm still not completely happy with where things have landed, but there are some things that are moving in a positive direction in terms of increasing options for people in mental health, including um, some wording that came in uh, from the legislature related to developing new uh, community peer supported facilities uh, proposals are supposed to be coming in by the end of this year. And um, as Mike knows, who was my legislator, I've been advocating for more of these kind of facilities for over 10 years as a citizen. And so I'm really grateful as a legislator to see that some of these things are coming together. And one of the things I'm learning is that it's there's an awful lot of compromise that goes on in this job. You know, you can advocate for what you believe in. And in the end, you have to have a majority of people agree with you to make things happen. And so I realized I'm not gonna get all the things that I want, but I am doing some work that I do feel really good about. And I feel like I'm helping to move the conversation in, in a good direction. Um, so I just wanted to name a couple of other bills that I have um, had my finger on the pulse of and been partly involved with. One of them uh, passed recently uh, out of the house, H-171, which is what we're calling the child care bill. Um, I believe both Mike and myself were co-sponsors of that bill. Um, and that does a couple of things to increase both affordability of childcare, uh, putting funding into childcare resources so that um, no family in Vermont with, uh, within, I think it's about a three year span, we should be at a point where no family should have to spend more than 10% of their income on childcare. Um, and another uh, component of that bill is um, it's providing some funding for need-based supports for people who would like to go into early childhood education because that's an area where we have a shortage of staff and the pay is not a very uh, enticing uh, rate. And so we're trying to find ways to, to make it easier for people who are passionate about, about caring for children to become professionals and to work in this field. Um, so that passed out of the house, I believe last week. Uh, now, just in the last couple of days, we had two more bills passed that I wanted to uh, touch in about. Uh, both of those are in the education realm. One of them is H101, which was a bill related to early childhood literacy. And another one is H106. And H106 is one related to providing grants for community schools. And I was actually a co-sponsor on that bill, which encourages putting forth money for up to 10, 10 school districts in our state to get grants to, to make their schools serve a broader range of students in the community in a broader range of ways. So for example, to provide additional mental health and physical health resources to students who may not have the ability to get those in the community very readily, to make the school more of a hub for the services that, that they may be needing. Um, and I feel really good about this, um, about this and it, uh, it passed, I believe, yesterday. So it's um, hot off the presses. Um, those are the only uh, legal updates I was gonna mention to you. I did wanna just mention one more thing, which is um, I've been working with a constituent in Westminster, uh, Jeanette Staley, who has um, been very eager to set up an equ equity advocacy group in our community, not under the auspices of any one town, but just in the community, working on anti-racism and other kinds of equity advocacy. And we've had two meetings so far, and we're still, the group is still coalescing and figuring out what, are, what is our mission and what kind of work are we gonna do? But if you have an interest in working in, the, in that realm, doing anti-racist work and other kinds of advocacy towards a more equitable society, um, send me an email, drop a note in the chat, and I'd be happy to send you information about that. Our next meeting will be on March 25th. So I would like to, after that big long uh, <laughs> string of announcements, um, I would like to go ahead and hand it over to Malika Puffer, who lives in Dummerston, uh, works for HCRS uh, in their peer services uh, department, and has some strong feelings about the secure residential facility and has been doing a lot of advocacy around this. And I asked her to come in and just give a little update of, you know, what is the site? What is the proposal? What are, what are the concerns? Malika? Thanks so much, Michelle. And thanks uh, to both of you, Mike and Michelle, for, for making this space. It's really, really uh, helpful to have this kind of direct communication. Um, and yeah, Michelle has been so helpful on this issue. One of, one of our, um, you know, main allies really in the legislature. Uh, 
So um, the the background, I think that's helpful for people to know is that um, there is a, I'm going to say quote unquote residential program that exists currently because typically residential programs are not locked, but this facility that exists in Middlesex, uh, it's been around for uh, since since the hurricane, since Irene, um, is a locked seven bed facility. And they, it, otherwise in the state, the only locked psychiatric settings are um, psychiatric hospitals um, or, or psychiatric wards within um, general hospitals. And um, the only difference between the current Middlesex facility and a hospital setting is that um, the Middlesex residents doesn't do uh, restraint, uh, you know, holding people down, putting physical hands on people, um, putting people in restraint chairs, and they don't do um, uh, seclusion, also known as solitary confinement. Uh, so the proposal that that's uh, gained quite a bit of controversy this year uh, that the Department of Mental Health and the governor have put forth is to create a uh, a facility to replace that one because it has some issues with the with the facility itself with a 16 bed, uh, locked facility instead so that's more than doubling the size and um, and also originally the part of the plan was to include the ability to do what they call it emergency involuntary procedures putting hands on people putting people in a restraint chair um, and solitary confinement uh, there are a number of concerns about this for me. One is the mislabeling of this as a, a therapeutic community residence. That's the lowest level of licensing for a group home in Vermont. The proposed facility was not therapeutic, not in the community, and really not a residence. Um, more akin to a a prison in, in so many ways. And there are there are a ton of parallels between the mental health system and the policing and prison systems. Um, the other concern uh, is that we, there's, there's a narrative in the community uh, that we need more locked inpatient settings. I'd like to talk about that a little bit, but that is not my belief um, at all. And uh, the reason that DMH is, is saying that we need to expand that capacity is because people are waiting too long in the emergency departments. Maybe some of you in, have heard about or encountered that issue. Um, and, and, so, and so there's there's been a lot of money uh, proposed for this project, but also, yeah, I'm, I'm parked outside of the Brown River Retreat because I have terrible internet <laughs> at home in Demerson. And, um, you know, they're, they're about to open a new 12 bed uh, unit uh, this year. So we're already expanding inpatient capacity. And at the same time that we're creating more and more locked spaces to put people in distress in, there is an absence of investing in solutions in the community. If, if any one of us uh, is in extreme distress and we need support from another human being, if you do not have the privilege of having friends and family that you can go to safely about that distress, your only option is going to the emergency department. You have to go to BMH, you have to go to Grace Cottage, uh, where you will likely stay for a long time, get virtually zero support, be kept up all night by noise, be in a white walled room. It's just a recipe for, for, for trauma and crisis. So um, we need to create a place for people to go in the community so that they don't have to go to the emergency department when they're filled with grief or they're filled with uh, terror. Um, these are things that we can attend to with our community members uh, in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases without putting people in cages. Uh, and, and then uh, finally, it is a racial justice issue um, as well as a disability justice issue because people of color, uh, this is very well documented, um, historically and currently in psychiatry are, are much more likely to be perceived as dangerous. And the determination of who ends up in these locked places, which, which I should have said in the beginning, I'm, I'm a psychiatric survivor, I've, I've experienced psychiatric incarceration. Um, 
the, the decision about who ends up there is not a medical or scientific decision. It's a it's a judgment call of the people who are who have the ability to make that decision. And um, predominantly, those people are are white and middle to upper class and able bodied. And so uh, we see that people of color are much more high, disproportionately represented in locked settings while being underserved by voluntary services in the community. Um, and that is true in Vermont as well. We have data from the state hospital in Vermont, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, that 15% of the residents are people of color or inmates, perhaps would be the, the better term. Um, so anyway, the, the, that was, those are sort of the issues that I and other um, advocates and allies as well have rallied around this year. And the consequence has been that they have removed the, the plan and the intent to use restraint and um, solitary confinement in, in this facility. And there's been a proposal to make it eight beds for now instead of 16, although um, I'm not sure that that's really going to go anywhere. So I, I wanted to, uh, to, to make people aware of that. And, and um, I think the, the larger context for this and the reason why I think the general public um, and many legislators as well um, are supportive of the concept and not very critical of the idea of, of increasing locked involuntary spaces is the, this idea of sanism. And I know many of us this year have been learning a lot about other kinds of isms. And I think it's because of that that we've seen a good turnout from the community, from people who are not psychiatric survivors being concerned about this. Sanism is the systemic and systematic discrimination and hostility towards people who are perceived to have mental or emotional differences. Um, and I wanted to, I'm going to wrap up really soon because I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to share a little snippet of an example of the way that Sanism has showed up in Dummerston recently, uh, which is that uh, so a while ago, uh, my partner and I were at home watching a movie or something. We heard a knock at the door and it was some concerned, very kind, uh, wonderful neighbors, uh, uh, checking on us to make sure we were okay, which is so lovely. Um, but they said that uh, some folks in the neighborhood had heard someone screaming in the woods. They believed it was a, a woman's voice in the woods yelling for help. And they had heard the words pretty clearly. So they're pretty confident it was a person, not an animal. Um, and, and they were really trying to, to be so responsible and, and, and uh, you know, make sure everyone was okay. But one thing has really haunted me from that interaction, which is that one of them said, and, and I, you know, I don't blame, blame this individual at all, but they said, you know, we didn't want to go towards the voice because what if that voice was someone who had escaped from the retreat, someone psychotic, and it would, maybe it wouldn't be safe for us to go to that person to try to help them. And I think that in a nutshell is... Uh, sort of symbolic of the situation more generally, which is that, you know, we all at some point in our lives will likely experience some extreme distress. Uh, and if we don't, certainly some of our loved ones will. And if, if that distress is interpreted as mental illness, yeah. people are, are um, <clears throat> That's what happened to me in the know, grocery store. Yeah, people are, are, if we come seeking help, people might actually perceive us as a threat. And, and that is the, the kind of it, the situation that we have that results in such a desire to lock people up while we aren't pr providing the needed voluntary supports in the community. So thank you all so much for listening, giving me this space, uh, and happy to talk more about it, so questions, hear, hear what other people have to say. Thank you for sharing that, Malika. And um, I did just want to say that, um, you know, like I mentioned at the end of my presentation, there was language put into the Capitol bill encouraging community partners to put forth proposals for residential alternatives, which could both be a diversion from going to the hospital, as well as a step down for people who have been in the hospital. And there is a very dire shortage of facilities along those lines, of residences along those lines. And um, I sure hope that uh, 
you know, maybe you or maybe someone in Southern Vermont will be looking at, um, at providing one of those models because I do know there are a number of individuals who have been seeking those kind of supports. And although there are some residences in Vermont, they are always full. There, there just is not the capacity and people end up going to the hospital when they really would rather be cared for in a less restrictive, less expensive and truly more therapeutic environment. So I hope you'll be able to continue this conversation and maybe help us craft some more good options for the future. I really appreciate that. Um, but I'm wondering now, I guess we're ready to open this uh, to the group. What would you like to know more about? Does anyone have follow-up questions either for um, Mike or myself or, or for Malika? or a question about something else. Uh, Michelle? Yeah. Uh, before we came on, Claire Wilson had a question about Amtrak, and I wonder if she would want to repeat that question <laughs> that she shared with me. Well, we know that um, our transportation system, as it exists now, with people driving around in their cars so much, is, uh, is a problem for the environment. Um, there used to be an Amtrak train that stopped in Brattleboro. How about working toward getting Amtrak back in this state? Yep. Oh, yeah. Well, well, thank you, Claire. And, and um, I'm glad you asked that question. And um, that is being worked on. You know, one of the challenges with any public transportation right now is how to do it safely. And, and because of that, ridership was way down. Um, the trains still are running, but the, it's only the freight trains. Um, but there are efforts to get the Amtrak back up into Vermont, and, and actually there are ongoing efforts to have the, uh, the train continue up to Montreal, which it used to do. Uh, that train used to be called the Montrealer. So mm -hmm. there's, there's work going on in that. Uh, stay tuned for when that would happen, but we hope again, as more people get their vaccinations, that more people will feel safe to be out in public more, especially in enclosed places like trains. Um, the bigger issue is, is public transportation in general. Now, transportation and home heating are the two biggest areas of Vermont's carbon footprint. And one of the things a lot of us have been uh, encouraging our governor to participate in and sign on is a 14 state collaborative effort called the Transportation Climate Initiative. If you wanna um, find out more information about that, I can send you the link or you can go, go to the Georgetown University website, uh, Transportation Climate Initiative there. Uh, what that would do is it would give states like Vermont uh, resources to, to design a state public transportation plan, which we don't have. You know, there are a lot of challenges to creating a transportation system in a rural area, but it can be done. There's lots of ways they can, we can do it. One of them is increasing uh, rail and, and light rail service and then having Uber type vehicles to feed people over to the, to the trains. So right now the governor doesn't wanna join the Transportation Climate Initiative. Uh, we're hoping he does, and if not, we may have to push forward legislation to, to force Vermont to be part of that. Uh, but long term, uh, I totally agree that trains need to be the solution to, to making sense, making dollars and, and, and cleaning up carbon from the air. So thanks for that question, Claire. I can just add a tiny bit to that as well, Claire. I had a couple of people contact me asking about Amtrak. And so I sent an, uh, a message to the governor's office and um, the response was not extremely specific, but it was somewhat specific in a way that could be helpful. Um, I heard back from him, I would say Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. And they said that they were working on a plan for getting Amtrak going in Vermont again. And they were hoping to be able to issue something publicly within about three weeks. So at this point, if their timeline is accurate, we should be hearing from them in about two and a half weeks, which would put it, you know, it's gonna be into April and also into the zone when we'll have a large majority of Vermonters who will be immunized at that point as well. So I'm hopeful that we will be hearing something soon uh, about reinstituting Amtrak for uh, passenger commuters. Yep. Eva. I'd like to drop back to Malika and thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, I wonder if 
any of the work you've done has hooked in with the Freedom Center. Uh, I think a lot of times women who challenge their their difficulties and oppression are seen as, quote, crazy or unable to cope because they're not good parents or whatever. And I'm wondering if you're able to do some work with them. And I so deeply bow to the work that you've done, having uh, grown up in a household where my mother was seen as the other for 30 years incarcerated. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. Um, I have some connections to the Women's Freedom Center. My partner actually used to work there, and I have a friend who who works there. So um, I don't think I don't I wouldn't say we have any. I don't have our our program at HCRS peer support. We don't have any formal collaboration with them, but we've consulted with them before and and just have that informal connection. But absolutely, those issues are so connected, and some of the ways that. Um, historically and currently mental illness has been conceived of it has been in a gendered way so that the the, the struggles and the oppression that women and gender non-conforming people experience is, is pathologized uh, which just is a- adding harm upon harm basically yeah. well thank yeah. you for that thank you for your work yeah thanks Cheryl go ahead Oh, thank you. I've got um, uh, just a couple of comments for your consideration. One is an update, but the first has to to do with uh, the people waiting study. I'm sure you're hearing a lot about uh, that right now with Senate Bill 13 and uh, the uh, House Bill 54. Uh, are the numbers I'm looking at at any rate. And I'm, and I know that there is more um, concern and activity and a lot of commentary going on. I just want to bring it to your intention. And I think you probably know, you know, um, Michelle, you were citing um, a recent December report. The, the one that is quite relevant in this context is the report from December of 2019 that did an evaluation of the impact of the of people waiting and offered very clear recommendations to the Vermont legislature. That report was commissioned by the legislature and was submitted by Dan French on behalf of all of those who did it. And the bottom line of it and what all the discussion around it is, is that the current uh, Bill 173, if it is not um, implemented in a way that takes into consideration the disproportionate impact on children in low-income communities or, or communities with special needs, it'll just be exacerbated. It'll make it even worse. So Westminster's done an analysis, or actually the whole supervisory union, uh, Wyndham Northeast, has looked in the consequences to taxpayers could be another million dollars a year. So I just want you to be alert. I know that neither of you are on on that House committee, um, but be aware of it if you can talk to any of your uh, peers about supporting uh, either H.R. 54 or whatever crosses over, um, if and when it does. That's my point around that one. Uh, And then I can give you a brief update on what's going on with Westminster's efforts to withdraw uh, from the forced merger with Athens, Athens and Grafton. But before I do that, do you have any comments about the waiting study? Um, sure, I could uh, share that <clears throat> um, there actually hasn't been a lot of talk in the House about this. Um, in, in fact, the Education Committee and the Ways and Means Committee, like all committees, have really been focused on COVID. And uh, the Education Committee has been also looking at how kids are doing this year. Uh, passed out four bills this, this, this week that they've been working on through this session, which have to do with literacy, which have to do with the, the, the buildup of infrastructure that needs to be addressed because we haven't been funding buildings for so long. And then this, this idea for community schools. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's... The talk that I have heard is that what's hanging up this piece is uh, I don't think anybody doubts that we want to make sure kids uh, get the best that they can. Uh, Right now, there are no proposals that don't put stipulations in there that say town, let's say they get extra money for this. There's no stipulation that they're going to send it and spend it on the kids. There's, there's, a, there's actually uh, 
concerns that there are towns that just will take that money, turn it over to taxpayers and reduce taxes. And that's where this is hung up right now. Uh, so I think uh, a lot of us, myself included, who work with kids know what, what needs to happen and that there are lots of needs that aren't being met, are certainly willing to move forward with that. But I'm not willing to say, oh, a, a town feels like their taxes are too high and they want to reduce their taxes and not give the money to kids. That's what's hanging this up right now. And I think it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's a complex piece. And um, it's going to take some time to sort that out. Michelle, did you want to add anything? Um, I would just say I, I heard Laura Sibilia do a presentation about this at the Rural Economic Development uh, Caucus, oh gosh, probably a month ago. And um, I mean, I, I definitely think the waiting study, the the, what I've heard about the report, it actually sounds like it's a really good idea. And I do hope that it goes mm -hmm. forward. But like Mike was saying, we just need to make sure that should the funds be returned to the communities, we need to make sure that it's going in to address the needs of the students in that population, not that it's just randomly tossed into the budget for whatever the, uh, the community feels like using it for. Right. Thank you both. Um, to, to Mike's point, I actually haven't heard that yet. So I'll follow up with the people who've been talking with me about that. I think what, so I appreciate your comments. The quick update uh, about Westminster's effort to withdraw from the forced merger. I think you know that on March 2nd, both Athens and Grafton um, voters did vote to uh, approve that, ratify that withdrawal. And what's important is that no one is proposing to dissolve the new Wyndham Northeast Unified School District. Athens and Grafton would remain in that district, at least as it's envisioned. And Westminster is simply withdrawing from that to reconstitute the new uh, school board. So where that stands right now, um, based on the votes of the Westminster voters in January of 2021, uh, having been approved and ratified then by Athens and Grafton, the select board has appointed an interim school board. I do serve on that, whereas I also continue to serve as an elected member of the of the Wyndham uh, of the Wyndham, you know, Northeast Unified District, Athens, Grafton, Westminster. Um, uh, the interim board has no authority. Uh, a new board will have no authority until and if the state board of education approves Westminster's withdrawal. So currently, Larry Slayson, the town attorney for Westminster, is looking at next steps. We understand that a next step will be to take the information about the ratified vote in Westminster and the subsequent votes in Athens and Grafton to the state board with the request that Westminster be allowed to officially withdraw. So that's where we are. It's, it's moving forward. Thank you both for your support for all of that, by the way. Thanks for your update, Cheryl. Hey, Cheryl, are you still on the board? In in yes. Okay, so you're yeah, a good I'm point still person. A, if people right. have questions and want to contact somebody, you'd be somebody. I'm happy. I'm happy to respond to questions. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, as I was saying a moment ago, the Unified School Board still has authority. The Westminster Athens Grafton School Board still has authority, and I am um, vice chair, actually, of that uh, of that board. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Doug. Did you have a question? Yeah. Thanks. I have a, actually a comment, and then two questions. Um, the comment is thanks for your comment the other day regarding those airplanes. Um, I wasn't angry. I was just amazed. They flew right over my house. I mean, I used to fly as a, as a, as a kid in high school. So I understand how it's, how fun it is to fly low and buzz houses, but uh, there were three in a row, boom, 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 right over the house. Anyway, thank you for commenting on that. Um, two questions. One is a little longer than the other. Um, the first question is, has anybody, and this is not restricted to our legislators, but anybody had your finger on the pulse of HR1? I put in the comments section of, uh, an article that Bill McKibben wrote that really had me down in the dumps earlier in the week. And basically the premise was, if we don't get control of um, voter suppression and control the minority who's controlling the majority now, 
we will never get out of the woods on climate. And, and so you're talking about the federal bill. Federal bill. Has anybody got their finger on the pulse? Yes or no? And I, I just want to know if there's anything we can do locally to help Bernie and, and Pat Leahy and, you know, Peter Welch. Um, well, I think we know where they are, where they stand on this. And what I think the best thing we can do on federal legislation is if you know people in other states to contact them. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay, so that <laughs> we're together on that. Um, so anyway, I put it in the chat. If you haven't read it, I would suggest you read it. Um, um, the, the last question, uh, somebody mentioned earlier about um, uh, money going to kids versus you know, property tax. So we're gonna get a check, some of us, maybe get more, more or less. And the question then is, um, there's one advice by a, a person named Susie Orman, who's a, a financial economic person, to save it and keep it for a rainy day. And I'm thinking that stimulus, the $1,400 number, is supposed to be spent. And she's suggesting keep it in case you need it next month or the month after. So I'm just wondering if there's any advice from, from you folks. I mean, I, I don't need the money to pay bills because I got a steady income. I'm Social Security um, in, a, in a retirement, whatever. I'm going to spend it. I'm not going to save it, I don't think. I'm just wondering if, if that's the right thing. I, I don't know if there's one answer to that, Doug. I think that um, that's largely going to be a matter of individual decision. I know a number of people, including myself, who actually gave a large portion of our initial stimulus away because we didn't need it. I am still employed. So is my husband. And we gave away the bulk of our first stimulus check because there were community entities that were needing it um, a lot more than we were. Um, but then there are other people that, you know, that have individual needs. And if you don't have them now, you know, it's, it's totally up to you. I mean, if, if you want to keep your money, you want to save it, you want to donate it. I think they're really all of those could be good options depending on what your individual situation is. I don't know if Mike has other thoughts about that. I think that is a good perspective here. Um, I did notice Ruby McAdoo's had her hand up for a while. So Ruby, do you have a question? Um, I do. Hi, Ruby McAdoo from Putney. First, I wanted to say that um, I have always been inspired by Michelle and I am currently baking a marbled banana bread because of her, because she's always cooking and posting and <laughs> letting us know what she's doing. So I thought, oh, I'm going to listen to these guys and do this while I'm doing it. So anyway, so that's in the oven. Um, uh, before I ask my question, I just wanted to reply to Doug that um, I'm the coordinator of Putney Community Cares. And recently, if you look at our Facebook posts, um, you'll see an article that discusses exactly that point. And I think that for some people, the stimulus, saving the stimulus check and putting it into your savings account is actually replenishing what you've had to dip into. And so it really is so specific to what our own individual needs are. But if you're looking for ways to get, um, to get your stimulus check to, to benefit the community, there are organizations like Putney Community Cares, there's the Putney Pool Fundraiser, <laughs> that if you are looking for somewhere to, to give your money, those are, those are options as there are many others as well in the community. So if you, if you have Facebook or are interested, I would look um, for that article. It had many ways that, um, to suggest how you could use your stimulus check. Putney anyway, Pool. Yeah, yeah, Putney Pool, that is a big one. Um, so the reason I raised my hand is that, um, I had a question and wanted to hear from Mike and Michelle, and it kind of dovetails with what Malika was talking about in some ways, because I feel like in our community and across the country, I'm hearing more about school resource officers. And I know that this is, is, is something that's being, I think, being discussed um, in Montpelier, and it is definitely starting to be discussed in the Wyndham Southeast School District. I don't have children in high school. And so I really am relying on people I know who really understand it more. And I feel that people are very passionate and very impassioned when they speak about it. I'd like to understand what my legislators think and what you're hearing um, to help me inform me in terms of what, when I hear it locally, what, what to think. 
I know there's been a movement that has largely been spearheaded by youth around the state of Vermont, including activist youth in the Brattleboro area, working against the idea of school resource officers in Brattleboro and around the state. I actually don't know if there's an exact bill connected to that yet. If there, if it's been proposed, it has not come to the floor as far as, I, as I'm aware. But I know that there's a strong movement encouraging getting rid of the school resource officers because of the many problems that come along with that particular role. So I don't know if, if Mike knows if there actually is legislation you know, that's closer to us um, voting on. I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but I personally would support getting rid of the school resource officers and redirecting funds in the way that we just put with the um, community grants program, trying to have true resources, not, not people in a law enforcement position, but people in social services and other kinds of roles, providing needs to students as they come up. Sure, I, I think right now, this is something that's happening in the Senate. So uh, we're following it a little bit, uh, more tangentially than focused on it. But I can also share a little bit of the history in, in our county about this. Um, our last sheriff, not the current one, Keith Clark, um, was the first, when he was the chief of police in Bellows Falls, he was the first police chief to bring a social worker into police work. And in that first year, they had the social worker there, arrests went down 50%. Now, this is something that's continuing where now the state police, actually the, the woman who's in the Westminster barracks was, was the person that Keith hired in, in Bellows Falls originally. So we're trying to get social workers in police departments in the state police. Um, the initial idea for having a resource officer locally was based on that idea that this wasn't necessarily just somebody who works for the police, but somebody who could connect students with various resources uh, before they got to the point where there was where they were in crisis and needed something else. Um, I think it's like a lot of what's happening. Uh, we're we're looking at how we do things differently with with policing, and this is this is an area where I think we need to take a look at it. I think the idea of uh, more social workers, both in police or the schools, is what makes a lot of sense for me. And just there as a, a heads up, Ruby, your kids are going to be in high school before you know it. There is a note in the chat from Anne that says there are two competing bills in the Senate, one to end SROs, school resource officers, and one to expand them. So that has not come to our table yet, but apparently there is legislation actively pending. And I have heard about that legislation, and I certainly would be on the side of removing that role and putting people into the schools in a different capacity. Um, Malika, you had something to add to this? Yeah, um, I just want to, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm totally in support of removing uh, school re resource officers and, and somewhat neutral, I guess, about replacing them with, with uh, you know, social workers and other providers. But regarding the uh, embedding social workers within the police departments, I just wanted to know that that's something that I'm actually quite concerned about and, and wouldn't myself support I think we need uh, we need less integration between um, uh, mental health and, uh, and and police rather than a, a more enmeshing of them there's already a huge amount of um, overlap there and uh, I think what we really in long term need is a a different response system for uh, people in emotional distress that is, is not part of the police department does not, not um, uh, as, as a rule include the police. So, um, I mean, that's a whole other conversation, but I just wanted to know that that's something that the, um, generally speaking, the uh, psychiatric survivor mental health advocacy community doesn't really support. Ruby, does that, answer your question or did you have something else to share on that? Ruby, before you go, do you wanna talk a little bit about, I mentioned the Putney Pool. Yes, yes, I'd love to talk about the Putney Pool. Um, so as people in Putney know, the pool um, was not open for the last season 
in part because of, um, I think that they would have been affected by COVID uh, restrictions anyway, but they had a pretty catastrophic um, damage to the pool lining that would have cost a lot. $125,000 was their estimate. And, um, and so at the start of this season, the town manager um, and her assistant manager are putting a push to raise money from the community towards that repair. So they're, they've started a fundraising endeavor, sent a mailer to all Putney residents, and, um, or at least all mailboxes, and um, with a goal of raising $125,000. And that is um, that will be ongoing until the goal is reached. But the town is moving forward with trying to secure um, a contractor to fix the pool. So they will be expending the money, and the fundraiser will be to replenish the coffers. Um, and I I don't think that they're ready at this point to. Um, speculate on opening dates and when it will be done. But I think the goal, as long as they, as all the ducks are able to be lined up and they get a contractor and the contractor keeps schedule, I think the goal is to have the pool open this season, which is really, um, really life-changing for our community, both the younger uh, families in our community, but also the, family people without families who um go to do laps go to cool down on a hot day um i i when the pool was open my family went to the pool every single day and when it was raining <laughs> and when it was really hot and um and it's a beautiful pool that is not super crowded and so it really does serve um it, it's it's an inviting place for even for kid, people who don't have kids and maybe are kind of not kid people because there are times when there's almost no one there. And I miss that in our community and I think everyone does. So I'm hopeful that we can rally. Um, there, I and, and another, um, we're just kind of formalizing it and figuring out what it will look like. But um, I and an, a, another um, parent are helping trying to help with fundraising endeavors and how how do we you know have a campaign how do we get the word out how do we keep this as a current um focus in our community so that we can achieve that fundraising goal i think amber paris who's a local artist will be creating signage that helps us to see the thermometer that you know the progress of what we're um contributing um so that's that's it right now and i think that um I don't know if they're, I think that they're working out how we can um, keep people informed via social media because social media is not really this, this, a strength of our town office and there isn't really a, a social media page right now. So either it will, um, they will figure that out or uh, uh, some, I, we have as the Putney, Central School PTO, we have often stepped in as kind of um, a platform on social media for them. So we may do that again. Um, and Putney Community Cares oh, has started to try to promote um, people to fundraise there as well. That's all. Well, thank you, Ruby. This is uh, certainly a, a vital resource for recreation in the summer. And I should share that uh, Senator White and I met with the, the commissioner of the Department of forest parks and recreation to see what kind of grant money there's is out there and we think there might be some options but the reality is grants usually require matches so we're still going to have to fundraise locally so please mm -hmm. think about that and spread the word eva did you have a question eva you're muted eva you're muted I want to share two things. I don't know how many of you uh, received this, but it's very important newsletter. Malika, you know this. Malika, I don't think I, I don't think I do know that. It's called the Independent, the Vermont Center for Independent Living Publication for Elders and People with Disabilities. And there's several good articles in there about uh, policing in the schools and so on and so forth. Everybody should, you can pick it up for free uh, now and again, but it, it really helps to, to uh, 
subscribe to it. It's a fabulous, fabulous uh, newsletter. This is uh, last fall's uh, newsletter. And uh, it's so important. And it covers issues that uh, psychological, physical, uh, you know, those of us that get excluded. Like I said one time on this, uh, there's, there's at least two thirds of the town doors that I can't open because I have upper body disability. That's one thing. The other thing is dropping back to the pool. The pool is like the Chinese restaurant. Everybody, no matter what their economic level, is welcome to that pool. And I think it's so valuable for the community of Putney. And I hope, uh, Doug, if you want to do something with your money, get in touch with Ruby. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mike, I just wanted to say we had a couple people that I maybe had technical issues and didn't end up joining our call till relatively late. I'm wondering if either Alice or Matt have any questions or comments they'd like us to check in about before we wrap up. Can I speak or no? Sure, go, go ahead. ahead. Matt. I, I was uh, on that state Zoom the other day and they were talking about H-175, the redemption. You guys are up on that? The bottle, the bottle, yeah. Uh, well, one of the problems we're having, my wife and I, we have been going all over the place with our plastic bottles and bottles, trying to find a place to take them. We went into Hannaford's the doggone place you put the bottle in like 20 times and it wouldn't even take it and so many of our friends are just getting rid of it so i mean increasing the redemption is great but there's no place to take it hmm. what what can you do about it well that that bill will take care of it i mean right now they're unless it's a deposit bottle they, they're not going to take it right we couldn't there's no place taking them well, you can take it to the, um, the if, transfer if station. Up, will take them. The, the transfer station will take it. Will they give you the, the change back? Well, no, they're, it goes, they're, it goes that's, that's what we're town. looking for. Yeah. We're paying for it, and we were trying to get our money yeah. back on it. Well, where um, does that nickel and dime go to? Sure, uh, Matt. If you want, I can contact you offline. Okay. And, and hear more about your situation and we can we can figure that out well, it should be everybody if it's us and we can't find any places i'm sure all these nickel and dimes that are being spent for the recycling all right i'm talking too much outside yeah talking. no no it's it, it's yeah i i think there may be more to it and we've only got a few minutes here so i'll, I'll contact okay. you off, offline alice right. did you have something you wanted to say or ask I, I'm very grateful that you managed to turn my uh, sign in numbers blue and then I could sign in. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that too. I had a problem. Huh. Well, sorry, sorry about the technical difficulties. Yeah, so, we're still um, working on it. This Zoom world is not a perfect world. Yeah. Doug, you have a quick question. We're just about ready to wrap up, but if you have a quick one, we can maybe take you last. I want to tell Matt that if you take your bottles to the co-op, they will give you money. Putney Co-op gives you money. Ah, good to know. But is that the only one you know? It's the only one I go to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to interject. If you want to build up your good karma, take them to behind the Putney Town Hall and the money there that they make goes for the pool. <laughs> I take them there too. The, Ruby, okay, your so, hand is still up. Did you have a question? She said she just forgot to put it down. I checked in okay. the chat, so she's good. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you so much. Um, we're about out of time for this month, but we will be back. And, and please know anytime something comes up, um, if you don't know where, where else to turn, you can, you can look to us, uh, our contact information is is on the legislative website and uh you have our emails if you got the information for that so let's uh please feel free to contact us that's why we're here thank you thank you thank you this is the newest member of my household oh <laughs> look at that what's its name mr cute <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch.